Hey there, Amplifiers. Glad for you to be joining in and tuning in today. We have a great program. So this is about sharpening your message and making your words matter because at the end of the day, we communicate, we're people, and we need to, we need to communicate things that are effectively, uh, that are effective, I should say, perhaps. Perhaps words matter. <laughs> well, what's the big idea here is you may be a leader, but if you don't communicate effectively, you're going to be a limited leader. You, you, you can't reach your full potential if you're not communicating effectively. Uh, so we're going to be talking today about that because it, it matters. Uh, 13 out of um, 13 percent out of U.S. employees say that their leaders communicate well. That's a small amount, right? Um, and that's from Gallup research. Now, 93 percent of workers report that leadership that communicates directly and transparently is what keeps them on the job. So obviously we want to make sure that we're communicating directly and transparently to, to really be effective. So the key is the most powerful tool that you have as a leader to inform, to engage, to inspire is your voice. Oh, that's pretty good. And our guest today is really an expert when it comes to communications. So as you're tuning in today, whether you're watching this live or on the replay, make sure that you are sharing any comments that you have. We'd love to hear from you. Ask questions. We'll be looking at the comments after the fact and pulling them and sharing them as well. And then make sure to take action from what you're gaining today. Um, the big three topics that we'll be covering in this session, uh, how to present effectively in virtual meetings, it's kind of important in today's day and age. Uh, how to tell stories and share case studies effectively. Uh, it's really important to do. And then uh, why you focus on inspiring and selling, not just informing and sharing. So I'd like to welcome our, our guest today. He is a leadership communications coach whose clients include American Express, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, State Farm Insurance, the Brennan Center for Justice, and Comedy Central, just to name a few. Those are some pretty awesome names. He is the Senior Director of uh, Strategic and Executive Communications for a major nonprofit organization. And he has done some amazing editorial positions with Time Inc., PBS, and Nickelodeon. Also, his new book is Out the Language of Leadership, How to Engage and Inspire Your Team. Welcome to Growth Amplifiers, Joel Schwartzberg. Thank you so much, Kenny. It's my uh, privilege to be here. It's great to have you here, and I'm glad uh, that we're having this conversation because you can see right in our today's day and age that there are a lot of challenges that are coming up due to improper communication. Right. And I've been chatting for a little bit here, communicating, <laughs> but I'd like to kind of just start off with getting a, a backstory of how you got to be where you're at today and how come this is your passion that you're moving forward at this time. Right. My experience in public speaking and presentation goes way back to when I was in sixth grade uh, middle school. I started doing competitive public speaking, uh, which is called forensics. And I continued all the way through my senior year in college. I was a national champion in an event called after dinner speaking. And then I thought that was the end of my experience in public speaking. But what I learned, Kenny, is that as I interviewed for jobs, as I went to conferences, as I communicated with boss, uh, later with direct reports, I was using a lot of the skills I learned in competition to become a more effective speaker. Now, about three years into my public speaking training at that point, I noticed a disturbing pattern. And that's that while I was training public speakers in the classic ways you want to be a strong public speaker, they were using a loud voice, they were gesturing, standing in place, speaking with conviction, all the stuff you can Google, uh, they didn't know their point. And I would ask them, what's the point of your presentation? What are you trying to argue? They would throw other things at me, themes, topics, catchphrases, categories, titles. So I really shifted everything because if you don't have a point, it is so foundational that you are rendered pointless. <laughs> uh, that's what leads to rambling. People don't ramble because they're inexperienced or even because they lack confidence. 
They ramble because they don't know the point they're trying to make or they, what they think is a point is actually something else and that really limits them. So long story short, uh, I wrote a book called Get to the Point in 2017, which focuses on that. And then what I realized uh, late last year was that a lot of these ideas of identifying points and sharpening them and championing them uh, relate to leaders and emerging leaders and aspiring leaders uh, in very particular ways. So that's why I wrote The Language of Leadership to really talk about how leaders can do these two very important things, engage and inspire through language. Because, you know, you could throw a book, you could throw a rock in a bookstore and you could find all sorts of things on what leaders should be. They should be empathic. They should be listeners. They should have vision. They should be direct. They should be authentic and transparent. But how do their teams understand and receive those qualities? Uh, leadership, they don't use performance art. They don't mime, there's no telepathy involved. <laughs> uh, they speak, like you said, they use the most powerful tool they have, their voice. So the language of leadership and what I talk about these days are ways to use your voice. Now to be clear, that's writing, that's speaking, that's posting, that's tweeting, that's making a video, that's leading a meeting, all the different platforms where you can really use your leadership to engage and inspire your team. I think that's, really powerful because and what i'm cautioning you if you're tuning in watching the replay is sometimes we hear things we're like yeah i know we need to have a point or i know how to talk right but the there's you know subtle small differences can have a huge impact if you're making a loaf of bread and you're like what is this yeast ingredient well it only calls for half a teaspoon so it's not a big deal i just won't put it in there huge difference right absolutely uh I'll share just for myself that I was a horrible communicator early on. Like I remember doing a presentation one time to a school very, I think it was in my mid twenties or something. I was so, how bad were you? I was so <laughs> bad. <laughs> I was boring myself and I apologize to the audience. So like, what am I doing? Right. And it, again, it's not about, uh, how skilled you are. You know, nobody's born a great presenter. It's a skill and not a talent. That means we all came from the same place. And at some point we were all afraid. How did we overcome that anxiety? And how did we learn to move from just sharing ideas and informing an audience to inspiring them and galvanizing them to take action? And it's the difference, if I could put an example, mm -hmm. let's use the example of podcasting. Right. It's the difference between saying, I'm going to talk to you about podcasting and I'm going to show you why podcasting is the most effective way to reach our millennial audience. Mm. One is you're throwing your an idea out there, hoping for the best, but people are waiting to see what you're arguing. The second is making an explicit argument, which I call a point. I highly like your points. <laughs> and just to clarify, uh, so since since it was my mid twenties, uh, what I did that was helpful for me mm -hmm. is I started off with going to a Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. And like you said, learn some of the basics. Like I was, I wasn't afraid to get in front of people cause I played in bands and, and got on the stage, but mm -hmm. I hadn't learned even the basics of communication. Right. But then even after com completing Toastmasters and going through their full program, I, I didn't, they didn't quite have, some of the nuances and trainings to be a professional speaker or like leadership training. Right. Uh, and where someone like yourself can really help someone get those additional details. So just as you're tuning in, if you think, yeah, I kind of know these things. Yeah. I can speak effectively. There's a difference. Think about a time. Maybe you went to an event or a conference and someone came in and they captivated the whole room and everyone was listening in. Everyone got it. Everyone acted. It's different than talking to people and, and, and knowing what you're saying. Right. And it's not about who you are. Uh, it's about what you do, the decisions you make in that presentation, in the text, in your mindset, and in your presentation. I don't like to use the word performance because we don't act when we present. Uh, we are presenting. We are communicating authentically. So those three things, uh, your words. And I don't mean a script because I really encourage people mm -hmm. never to use scripts unless you have a teleprompter. Uh, but it's in your words, in your mindset, and in the way you present. That's where you're going to achieve that kind of impact on an audience. 
And, all right. Uh, I'm just taking that notes. You <laughs> present. So you can see the notes in the crib notes, guys. And <laughs> the way you present. I got it. Okay. Got it. Um, so, so now as we're talking about some points, let's, let's talk about some points because we have an audience here that will, will look at this and think about, Yes, that's great. But what can I do? What are some things that could take away from this? Um, so let's talk about presenting effectively in virtual meetings. In this sure. past year, I've had attended, I think we all have probably attended a lot of virtual meetings and they're not all equal. Right. And if they're done effectively, they can be engaging. They can be uh really helpful. They can present points, but if they're not, then everyone's checking their emails tuned out and right. it's a big waste of time. So right. as we move from rooms to zooms, and now it's about 18 <laughs> months, at least for me, um, you know, a lot of the same rules apply, but we forget about them because we're in our pajamas. We're in at home. For me, I'm with my cats. Uh, I'm not really thinking about, Oh, I need to use a strong voice. I need to be making points. I need to dress uh, in a way that supports the points I'm trying to make. So sometimes we forget things that we're actually in a work environment because physically uh, we're not. But some of the specific ways to elevate your points and your presence on Zoom, it starts with your frame. So we see a lot of people way back. Mm -hmm. uh, we occasionally see people too close or with their head, <laughs> that scares me, uh, you know, with their heads cut off or their way to the side. Yeah, you see that? <laughs> As if these things don't matter. And they absolutely do because you are the person who uh, who is conveying those points we need to see you and not be too distracted by the things around you now let's talk about that for example uh, for a moment i'd like to say that anything in your environment your physical environment that is not supporting your point is stealing from your point so make sure your environment is neutral or that it supports your reputation in some way. If there are books, there's a subconscious uh, uh, idea that there's some scholarship involved, that someone's smart. If you see a headphone, a microphone, like with you, uh, we see someone experienced in communication. But if you see a virtual background of MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, uh, that's stealing from your point. You may think it's kind of fun, but it's actually not helping. And if it's not helping, uh, it's hurting. A lot of people use blurry backgrounds on Zoom or they use funny backgrounds and they should realize that those things are very distracting for an audience. We understand that, but there's another thing that I like to remind people and that is that communication is supposed to be live and authentic. It's a human-to-human mm -hmm. -human relationship. When I use a virtual background, even a blurry background, I'm injecting something artificial into that communication, which I believe steals from some of the values, some of the impact, some of the humanity of that uh, discourse. And then the final thing I like to say is, you know, if you have kids or pets that sort of get in the way, sometimes you think, uh, well, that happens, this is life. Uh, but understand that if you have kids shouting in another room or they crawl onto your lap while you're speaking, you cannot parent and present simultaneously, you cannot. So if you're just attending a meeting, that's one thing. But if you're presenting, know that these live things going on, even if there's sounds, are not only distracting to your audience, but they're distracting to you. So come prepared to make points, put away, like you said, your email, turn over your phones. And last thing is remember that this is eye contact. I'm pointing to the small black dot that is <laughs> the camera. Uh, Kenny, I'm looking at you right now, and you could see I'm not really looking at you. So we have to sort of change our mindset to understand when I'm coming around to my big point, uh, this will save lives. This will sell more Coca-Cola. This will increase our revenue in the fourth quarter. If I want to use eye contact, which we know is a big deal, that means going right to here and to the black dot of the camera, not here necessarily to the Brady Bunch. Hey there, this is Kenny from Growth Amplifiers, here to ensure you get your awesome ideas into action to grow and improve your business and achieve your full potential. Take the first step by visiting growthamplifiers.com and clicking the Start Here button. Take the assessment to get your personalized score. Then select from free resources to learn how to improve your score. Don't wait, be proactive and take action now by visiting growthamplifiers.com and clicking the Start Here button. And always, 
keep on amplifying. Now, let's get back to the show. Uh, yes, that's a great point. I, 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 I really am going to take that to heart because sometimes we'll ask people to do like a video testimonial and then they're looking down somewhere. Right, right. Sometimes like, the notes are over here. You know, bring the notes as close as you can to that camera. So my rule of thumb is so that you're moving your eyes between your notes or your PowerPoint and the camera and not your neck or head. Do the right. Match thing. I, I will add one, one pet peeve of mine. If, if you're zoom screen and, and like, like the green screen feature doesn't work consistently with you, <laughs> don't use it. Right. <laughs> you're and blinking you in and out. Hands, you get yeah, your heads coming frame. in and out. Right. Like that's, that's horrible. <laughs> right. So <laughs> now we've conducted meetings in real rooms for hundreds of years. Well, how long? Decades, let's say. Right. Uh, there's no reason why we need to do something different just because we're on this new platform. So, I completely concur. Those are some great tips. Oops, I just jumped my gun a little bit. All right, so number two, right? So now we're talking about telling stories right. uh, and sharing case studies. I just mentioned doing video testimonials. Well, sometimes that could be guiding someone to tell great stories, or sometimes you have a story to tell yourself that can really help uh, people understand your, your points to your and the value that you provide. So some tips on that would be great. Sure, Kenny. And you don't meet, need me to come on to your podcast to tell you that stories are valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, if you tell personal stories, they your audience relates to you, you're creating human connection, you're illustrating something. But here's what people forget. The most important part of your story or your case study is not the story or the case study. It's the part where you, the presenter, says, this case study illustrates why we should. This story is an amazing example of why we must. Uh, this moment proves uh, that if we go in this direction, we will be successful. Often speakers and presenters, they think the story sells the point itself. It does not. Or they think they tell a story merely to entertain which does not serve your goal. Your goal is to convey your point, have that point received by your audience. So we, they need to hear those words. This story illustrates uh, what I'm talking about, which is that we should take on this particular approach to be successful. It's in those words that you elevate your story from riveting uh, to relevant. And it's only a relevant story that does what it's supposed to do which is to reinforce your point. The story is not to entertain if you know what you're doing. The story is another way to reinforce the point that you're ultimately trying to make. Another very simple but very powerful tip that you can easily miss. That's a perfect example. Easily miss it. You can tell this great story and think, yeah, I'm connecting the dots. People get this. But if you don't help them connect the dots and really drive that point home, it may not be connected as good as you think it is being yeah. connected. And by the way, it's also true for data. How many times have we seen someone present a data slide and said this went up 32%? Now let's move on. Uh, it's your job as a presenter to say, well, why is that important? Why is that relevant? What is our takeaway? You don't want us to just write down 32%. You want to take away how that impacts my job or my contribution to our goal. And, and, and Joel, I'll share with you because I've delivered my fair share of presentations. But it's it's challenging when you're trying to put it all together and you're trying to communicate all these different things. And it's very valuable to have someone who has your back and can look at all those different parts because you have a blind spot. Absolutely. Um, everyone has a blind spot and you may have a majority of it together, but if you're missing some key ingredients, then you're missing your full impact, whether you're talking to an audience or whether you're talking to your team. If you're not connecting all the dots, then you're, you're just missing your full impact, right? Right. And so realize, you know, two important things. One is a lot of speakers go into it thinking, what do I want to say? What do I need to say? Wrong question. The job is not for you to put words out there. Uh, the job is for those words to be received by your team so they can be uh, 
inspired by them. So you need to ask, what does my audience want and need to know? Not what do I want to say? Uh, mm. Because remember the, the end game, and I like to keep repeating this over and over. It's about what your audience receives. Did they receive your point? And when you practice uh, with someone watching, uh, you know, a colleague, something like that, you don't want them to say, hey, you did a great job. Right. You want to ask them, what do you think the point I was trying to make was? Or if they need help, here is the point I was trying to make. Did you receive it? Because realize this for your audience. How many ideas is your audience really going to take away or your team? One, two, three points. And by three, I mean two. Uh, not the whole thing. So one of the things you always need to ask if my audience, my team, my employees can only take away one idea, what is it I want them to take away? And now I'm going to work backwards to make sure I'm hitting that with as much mustard as possible, as I like to say, uh, so that they're receiving it successfully. I, I do highly think that's overlooked. And I, I admit, I, I'll fall into that trap. And a lot of the people that I work with fall into that trap, too, because we have a lot of knowledge, right? Right. So I work with a lot of different business advisors and consultants mm -hmm. that have a lot of knowledge and it's a little counterintuitive because we think, Oh, if I share more knowledge, right. This, this is, I'm helping more. Right. And I've more got all this knowledge. Right. And we've seen these presentations, right? All right. First, I'm going to go over the history of this challenge. Now I'm going to go over some of the details of the challenge, how much money we're investing in it, how many people are involved and how many facilities we're going to build. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that's informing an audience, but your job and everyone needs to know, sometimes it makes people upset, but everybody is in sales. If you have a good idea, it's like a fantastic product. You need to sell it. So you need to show its relevance, make points about it, not just inform, uh, not even just educate, but inspire, show the why, show the purpose. And that's what will hit people successfully. So I, I, that, I mean, that's just another great thing that people need to hear that I talked to a lot of people in in this past year plus I've been talking to a lot more people in the accounting space mm -hmm. uh, CPAs and bookkeepers and other business advisors and they're really good with numbers and really mm -hmm. good with kind of data but they're very adverse to sales right and a lot of a lot of times it's because they've been burned in the past by people who didn't really know what they were doing with sales and did bad sales Mm -hmm. So they're like, who likes, who likes to that salesy person who's pushing their stuff on everyone? It's like that's not really good sales anyway. Right. A lot of people I work with a lot of lawyers, and uh -huh. often they come across thinking because I'm I have so much information, I learned all the laws, therefore I can communicate it, or it's only my job to pass along the laws, but not sell those ideas or explicitly share the relevance of those ideas. So I have to, yeah, disabuse them of some notions <laughs> they have information in information out. No, that's not what a successful presenter does. I mean, that's, that's really transformative mm -hmm. when you, when you think about how many people, when they're ch chatting with someone, either one-to-one -one or they're perhaps doing a virtual event or they're speaking to an audience and they get this opportunity to be in front of people and share ideas. It's their time. People giving them attention. Right. And far too often they give a bunch of information and then any questions. Right. That's, that's what it turns down to. Right. All right. Let me, here's give, a a quick, let me give a quick tip to your audience. If you don't mind, uh, sometimes people say, I want to talk about X, Y, Z. So mm -hmm. what words can we use to make sure we're making a point? There are words I recommend. Uh, I suggest, I propose. Mm. If you stick those words in your presentation, it will force you to put your reputation on the line and to make an actual point to people, which will excite them. Then you need to prove that point. But you can use those phrases, I recommend, I propose, I suggest, which will force you to go from sharing to selling. I recommend you listen to Joel. <laughs> I propose you reach out to him and, and get a copy of his book. And I suggest that you follow his advice. It's good, well good done. stuff. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. All right. So that and to, just to get a better understanding, because people are tuning in and I'm sure by now they're like, hmm, I'm intrigued. What type of businesses, what type of people that you do you typically help? You've, you've got a, a great highlight of some of the larger brands. 
Uh, what type of businesses do you typically help? What sizes and, and types are best fit? My, my, uh, the secret sauce for mm -hmm. me is when I'm dealing with about a group of 12 to 15 people, uh, even more so than a one-on-one. -on -one. Because when you deal with a group, a smaller group, two things are able to happen. One, everybody is able to participate. And I make sure everyone is voluntold. That's <laughs> the term we sometimes use to make sure that no one is on the outside of the exercises. But then another very effective thing happens, which is people learn from each other. And I move every person from their idea of what they think is a point, elevate that to an actual point. And when they hear it happening, not just when they do it themselves, it just reinforces uh, that message and reinforces the exercise of trying to elevate your ideas to make sure you're selling and not just sharing. And it could be any group of people. I've dealt with lawyers, I've dealt with people in entertainment, uh, I deal with people who in the restaurant business, you know, we're making points to our, our mother-in-laws all the time. <laughs> so the, it's, a, it's a lifelong thing. I need to make an argument to someone. So they do one of two things. Uh, they think anew or they take a new action as a result of my point. That's what it means to have impact. So that can happen in your personal life, in your professional life, all over the place. So that's why I'm open to working with all kinds of people. And by the way, my workshop is the same for an intern as it is for a CEO, uh, because these ideas are so um, important mm -hmm. and they create the structure for everything else that's to come. They're foundational. So everyone needs to realize that when they have this aha moment, ah, I know what a point is. It actually makes my life easier because I know it's not about 732 words. It's about one point. Mm -hmm. uh, then they're off to the races. Then we talk about uh, specifying and sharpening those points and championing those points. And, and so you've, you've got this new book that has come out. If, if people want to learn more about you or the book and go to joelschwartzberg.net. Right. And um, could you give us a little taste of who this book's for and the value it provides and why someone probably should go ahead and pick up a copy? <laughs> I believe that anybody who is interested in leadership, whether you're an active leader, an aspiring leader, an emerging leader. By the way, if you're running a meeting, you're a leader. And everybody from the people on the lowest uh, lowest uh, level of the mm -hmm. totem pole to the top, they benefit from showing leadership qualities. And we now know that leadership is communicated through your voice. So what this book does, and I write in a very nuts and bolts kind of way, it's as much mm -hmm. manual as it is a, a good read. It helps you understand the mindsets, the tactics, and the techniques that you can employ a lot very easily to engage and inspire your audience, whether that's through a Zoom meeting, like I said, a video, a post, a tweet, all the different ways you can communicate. And now there are more than ever how can you be precise about that communication so you're having the impact you most want to have on them? Great point. We've got a comment coming in. Think anew or take new action. Great point. Uh, thank you, Lyman Montgomery. He is an amazing thought leader himself. And um, it's, it's really great that we're getting, getting that feedback. Yeah, and I appreciate that because we throw these words around like impact and success and effective. Those are broad words. So let's really, when we understand, when we want to understand how to use the language of leadership, we want to understand what is the specific impact we have. That's why I say inspire and engage. I picked out those two words in particular that I want leaders to convey and I want that impact to happen to their audience because I think those are the two most important leadership conveyances. So you've heard it from the man himself. This is about if you are looking to lead, which if you're you have a team, you're a leader. Pick up a guide that can help inform, inspire, and empower you to take new actions mm -hmm. and better lead your team. You'll not lose anything from doing it. You'll only gain. There's nothing to lose. So visit Joel's website, take action, check out the book. At the very least, um, we'd love to hear your comments, questions, or thoughts. Shares are always appreciated. Joel, it's been a pleasure having you on and contributing to Growth Amplifiers. I highly ha appreciated this conversation and the tips that you've shared with for our audience. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for the opportunity.
So the last thought as we're wrapping here, you know, you've shared plenty of knowledge bombs <laughs> along the way. But if you had one thing to share with others that are on their journey to continually amplify, just something that you've learned in your life lesson, it doesn't necessarily have to be communications related, but just what's kind of like a parting thought you'd like to share. I would say in my personal and professional life, what I've learned is that success is not waiting for things to fall into your lap. Uh, success is not an elevator, it's a ladder. And that means you need to grab the rungs, you need to pull yourself up, find those rungs, find those opportunities. And in communication, that means volunteering uh, to lead meetings, volunteering to give presentations at town hall. Practice will make you better. So look for opportunities to exceed, find them and proactively and actively take advantage of them because these days, nothing will fall into your lap. You need to step up to really move up the ladder. That's a great ending. Amplifiers are action takers. Uh, always check out if you want to tune in and subscribe. Go to growthamplifiers.com slash live. Joel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and contributing. Thank you. To show your support, take a moment to amplify this message by sharing it online. To connect with me or gain more business growth insights, visit www.growthamplifiers.com. Thank you for your support.